Not being about we need to tell somebody something, and rather start being about a conversation where we learn from each other. Now that was a political. All right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> decode that later. <laughs> I think I got it. I think I got it. Um, okay. I I I see uh, three hands. I'm going to make if they could all be three quick questions. I think we can keep ourselves to time. Uh, Peter, I'll come to you at the at the end if I can. Just just for just uh, go ahead. And, uh, well, I guess I'm going to have the ideology thing. Sure. But uh, one of the ideology that I have is that, you know, I have the perspective of being driven by facts. I do the math, I have the colleagues. And I do find ingenious the idea that, well, we have a congestion, why not take the people who they need rather than facilitate whatever exists? And I, I totally agree. My question is, in the existing setup of the decision making, do you feel that the engineering, the engineering profession, the engineering <coughs> expertise has enough input to define that common sense that you mentioned? Uh, Sorry, so I think one of the saddest moments in Toronto political history is when uh, the TTC fired Gary Webster. Mm -hmm. Right? And what was sad about it wasn't so much that an expert got fired, but rather what he got fired for. Um, Gary, I, I worked with Gary, uh, I first met him when I was an activist. We were working on Transit Integration Task Force. This would be 19, 19, 1991. So it would be 1991. And Gary was one of those people who both understood the, the technical thing, but also understood that it's about how people live their lives day to day. And he had a, a, a marvelous ability to think about how to map them onto each other. So he would talk to the different disciplines, the land use planners, he would, would talk to economists, and he would think about how you put these pieces together to solve current problems. He got fired for that. It's, so. But if you're an engineer and at the city of Toronto and we say, you know, how much would it cost to realign this street 10 meters north and how much infrastructure under the ground would you have to move and you show me and it costs X amount of dollars, I'll thank you and shake your hand and go and do that and have that decision all by myself. In terms of technical expertise, engineers are very, are very prized and, and valued at the city of Toronto. It's when they do the thing that I think they should do and understand that multiple disciplines have to have a conversation. That's where it breaks down. That's why I wanted to challenge all of you today to start thinking about engineering as a discipline that has to have conversations with other disciplines. Just a quick comment. I totally understand that uh, in order to, to put everything in the big picture, you have to see the big picture. And I fully trust the politician on that to do that. Seriously. There's one! <laughs> but I think we should have a bigger place on that yes, decision. Please. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, and there are some remarkably skilled professional engineers in the Toronto Public Service who uh, I trust my life with every day. Okay, two, two more uh, quick questions. Everybody, you've been great, by the way. Thank you. This is uh, the end of the afternoon, but these are going to be two great questions. Here we go. Uh, 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 just following up on what the councillor was saying, it's a really important point. OSPI has been, has been trying to decide at what role engineers' advocacy should take, because that's our function, advocacy and member services for the engineering community. There are really two roles that engineers play in society, and they're distinctly different. The first role is very much like the rest of the public, where we input into the discussion, but we have a, a very special place in that role because we have the technical and engineering knowledge to help people understand the issues in a little deeper technical way so that a good decision will eventually come out. But we don't make the decision, and we should not be making the decision. The decision about quality of life is made by politicians and the public together. And so if that decision doesn't go our way, and I can give you an example where we're dealing with it right now, if it doesn't go our way, we play a second role, and that is to help the politicians implement the plan that they've decided to choose in the best way possible. Because then we have the expertise to implement, okay? And it's not our job at that point to undermine the plan by going back and asking to change the plan again. 
Okay? So those are the two distinct roles, and we have to play them separately. We can't get those two roles mixed up. A good example is wind. We advocated to the government for three years to back off on the, on, on the targets for wind because the grid can't integrate that much wind, wind cheaply. The government backed off from 7,500 to 6,200 last year. We thought, great, they're listening. Last December, they put it back to 7,500 and added five years to the schedule. Now, there's no point arguing with the government at this stage that you're wrong. Go back to the old revised version. Our job now is to integrate that wind properly. And there are ways of doing it. It's going to cost a little bit of money. But our job is to do it in the most efficient, cost-effective way to reduce the pain and suffering on electricity rates at this stage. Not to go back and beat the government over the head that you made the wrong decision. It's too late for that. They've already rolled out the new plan. And otherwise, you, as we men mentioned earlier, you'll be going back and undoing the plan so often, nothing will get built. Anyways, that's more of a statement that's than a very, a... very good statement. Um, now we're, we're getting a little tight. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take your question, Peter. That would be the last one, but okay. very, very quick. Thank you, Richard. Uh, my question's back for Scott, but all of you have opined on this, it, and you split on it, and it really relates to your statement um, the, the, the rapid the downtown relief line should be the first of Metrolinx's next wave projects. Mm -hmm. I'm troubled by that. Unless you've done some analysis, why is that preferred preferred to the Huron Ontario LRT or improving service on the Go Stouffville line? Um, I'm kind of hearing a spectrum out there. Gord seems to be thinking that you know, maybe the suburbs need to be. Separate. Uh, so it was a, it's a pretty big question. Yeah. Uh, so I'll, I'll, how I'll do they just leave it to me? But who wants to just make, one person maybe just take that on, and, and it may not be a complete answer. Yeah. But it. So again, we've looked at the studies that have already looked at this. <clears throat> they've already looked and they've identified uh, the benefit case analysis cost for each of the lines within the next wave project, which we looked at. And a lot of them are based on uh, increasing development, increasing life, uh, sorry, lifestyles in these areas, specifically the. I can't talk too specifically on the uh, here Ontario line of Mississauga, but uh, the main issue with Young Street is that it's over capacity as it is today. It's needed today. It's not needed in 20 years, 30 years, which is what a lot of these other projects look for. Is saying yes, we need this. Um, you need this one now. You know, it's utmost important. Uh, when you look at how other next wave projects, such as the Young Subway extension of Richmond Hill. Um, TTC has highlighted that that shouldn't go ahead until you build this relief line because the young line just can't handle it. Uh, and again, it's the same question might come to the Scarborough subway that if you're going to bring more people in. Yeah, but what about Hamilton? You know, get that. <laughs> get my point. <laughs> All right. I, do you want to jump Well, in? I just would say that Metrolinx is looking at more of a regional approach. There are a lot of people in the $6 million mega plates that we live in that think that the plan is too Toronto centric. Mm -hmm. So you get a lot of 905 backlash on that. Um, I, I would offer that what we're looking at is, yes, a priority for the leaf line, but other priorities. And then one just doesn't have to start at the same time. There's others that can start at the same time. But start it, start it. <laughs> <laughs> OK, very good. Uh, I want to thank uh, Councilor Perks. I want to thank you, uh, Scott, uh, for your last presentation. Thank you, uh, Ed and Jack, for uh, jumping in on the, at the end uh, for the Q&A there. That was great. This has been a fantastic afternoon. Really appreciate it. One last order of business for me is to introduce uh, Jim Chisholm, uh, who's the past chair of the West Toronto Chapter of the Professional Engineers of Ontario, uh, to deliver the closing remarks. Jim, over to you. And uh, I know that if, if you have to leave, uh, you can let you